Robinson, um, who some of you may know who used to work for the museum. Uh, he's a naturalist. Then a bit of a presentation, pre-recorded presentation from me about uh, going out into the environment and what to look for. Um, and then uh, another naturalist, Brian Wilson, will also be speaking in that, that group. And, and we're tending to focus on small things. So this is very much looking at your small uh, insects, uh, the small animals that's out there in the environment. So I'll hand over to Simon to start that video. I will say that we may have issues with um, time lag with the video when it does start. And I do hope that uh, you'll be able to cope with that and that it will actually play okay for you. So uh, if there's any problem, we could always send links to YouTube videos at a later yeah. date. Yep. Lovely. Okay. okay. Right. Off to the time. Thank you. Life is absolutely everywhere around us and on us and inside us as well. There's uh, thousands of different uh, organisms that you can encounter in your average suburban garden. Some of them are, are quite large and you'll be able to see easily with the naked eye. Others are quite small and for those you'll probably need at least a magnifying glass, such as this one, or a microscope. And with the microscope, even on the larger things, you can see more detail. Now, uh, if you're looking around uh, compost heaps and things like that, you're going to find a number of different animals. Now, uh, those of you who uh, know your invertebrates, you're going to know that there's spiders, there's insects, there's millipedes, there's centipedes, and there's things like uh, slaters and landhoppers. Now, um, not all of those are insects. The insects, of course, are uh, six-legged and have got uh, three body parts. Then you've got the spiders that have got two body parts and eight legs. And then you've got the um, uh, myriapods and the chylopods, the uh, millipedes and the centipedes, which have got numerous legs, but also segmented uh, body parts. And then you've got things like slaters and landhoppers. Now, what are they? They're, they're not, they don't seem to obviously belong to any of the other groups but they are from a group that you've probably heard of before, and it's one that's been almost as successful as the insects in colonizing the land, fresh water, and the sea. And that's, of course, the crustaceans. So slaters are actually crustaceans, and distant relatives of prawns and crabs and things like that. Hi there, everybody. Um, we're just out here in the garden, checking out hunting for backyard biodiversity. Uh, Checking out these shrubs, you can see that there's a few things already flying around, and most of us will recognise those as being honeybees, which are Apis mellifera. They're an introduced uh, European, also called a European honeybee, um, and they're the ones that uh, uh, commercially uh, produce honey uh, that we buy in shops and things like that. So they're not actually a native species, and we're looking for our native wildlife here. So. One of the things that we've noticed in this shrub, which is really neat, uh, is something that one day will be a pollinator in its different morph, but at the moment it's a, a caterpillar. And we're going to have a look at this caterpillar and see what it is. And here's this little guy disguised in this shrub just here. Um, we'll show you a close-up of this caterpillar. And in order to, caterpillars, as all of you know, will either be moths or butterflies. So we're going to check out the details of this uh, caterpillar and see whether or not it's likely to be a butterfly or a moth when it emerges, when it, when it um, pupates and then emerges as an adult. So the spot we're in now is in an industrial area in Willoughby rather than in somebody's backyard. It's a little bit of wasteland that was between, is between two buildings. So one of the features with this particular site is it's gone from an environment that was a fairly simple environment, uh, dominated by lantana, and now we're looking at quite a complex environment. So we've, got, so we've got a variety of trees, shrubs, and ground covers and grasses. Have a look at it now and see what's here. It's really neat. Uh, so this is a little leaf hopper. You can just see him in here. Oh my gosh, he's got the most fantastic tail. 
and then as well as that down here you've got even better uh, something another sign not better my apologies um, curled leaves here held down with with webbing there's two of them here could be a, a leaf curl spider it could be caterpillar um, let's just take a little squiz and see if we can see anybody in there we can't see anybody in that one let's have a look in this one now when I was a kid I would have just ripped that open and gone ah let's have a look but I'm not going to because we don't need to can't see anybody in there at the moment but if we ask somebody who's a bit of a specialist on spiders and insects they may be able to tell us so we'll take a picture of that and we'll be asking that's right so just in here we found yet another insect uh, quite a common one to see around the area you can see the impact of this insect on the tree it's a petostrum a young petostrum and this little guy in here is a pitto beetle um, there's quite a few i can see about four or five of them on this this young tree at the moment and they're going to be chewing the leaves but you can see that there's nice new growth coming on this tree as well and, and it won't be okay so looking down at the ground covers uh, and the ground layers to see what's going on down here it's actually quite amazing the diversity of species that are down at this level uh, it's really really quite uh, exciting so starting off so we've got ground covers, uh, the actual plants that grow at this layer and looking around to see what's uh, using those. Um, on this side we've got native microlina which is a native grass. Uh, we've got the um, uh, native spinach as well, tetragonia as well. So something that we can feed on as well as native wildlife. Then we've got loads and loads of leaves. Uh, so the, all the leaves that have dropped out of the trees, uh, sticks, branches, all those sort of materials that uh, attract and provide habitat for an awful lot of uh, different species, so great biodiversity. So we're just going to turn over a few things and see what might be there. Okay, so just looking down to see what's in this leaf litter. I don't really want to put my actual hand in there without a glove on, so I'm just using a stick instead. Oh, there's some little insects running around. You can see it's quite moist underneath the uh, top layer of leaf litter. And you can see various leaves in various amounts of decay. And what's really worthwhile is when you're looking at this kind of thing, is having a microscope so you can actually have a look up close to see what's actually on those leaves and some of the insects that are there. Today we've come to visit one of the uh, bush backyards in Willoughby. So this is a great example of a native garden. One of the features in this garden that's really fantastic is this pond. Uh, sedge material in the pond is really beautiful. Uh, they've got water plants, uh, submerged water plants as well, and then uh, natural leaf material building up in the pond too. And that's creating quite a beautiful um, ecosystem, uh, pond ecosystem. So this pond will get frogs uh, coming into it. It will also get small uh, invertebrates like dragonflies, uh, dragonfly larvae, lots of other smaller animals that we might be able to take a look at later. Um, it can also get larger animals in too. So along with the frogs, um, one of the species that is regularly seen here is red belly black snake which is a beautiful animal, uh, quite stunning and, and amazing if you actually get to see them up close. It feeds, basically it's feeding on the frogs in the, the pond. So here you're probably looking at a great pile of firewood, but really it's a great pile of habitat. This pile is, is an awesome place for lizards as, and insects to, to live and to hide and to breed. So really, really great to have piles like this in your garden of something. Some of the other things that are really great to put down are things like bricks, piles of bricks, really, really awesome. Things like uh, your broad-tailed gecko, really like um, 
piles of bricks they like rock walls and things like that so piles of bricks can be really good for those guys lots of different skinks um, lots of different uh, invertebrates as well we'll use those tiles on the ground can also be really good and bringing the leaf litter up around the tiles so whatever you whatever you've got having it in among vegetation or in among um, leaf litter and things like that Obviously, if you're looking for things like reptiles, you're going to find in a pole like this, the reptiles are actually going to be, during the day, if it's sunny, they'll be up here and they'll be sunning themselves. They'll be frolicking around all over the place. When it gets a bit dark or if there's a predator around, they can shoot down and they're protected and uh, from any predators. So it, it provides that really good habitat. And at the same time, all of this material that's decaying and as insects in it also provides food for them as well. So so it's really an all-round great place, particularly for things like skinks and lizards. So at the bottom of, uh, in piles like this, what you're going to find with the organic material that's breaking down and turning into that beautiful humus at the bottom, that's where lizards are able to lay their eggs. And they'll, you'll find if you turn over material sometimes, you'll find those little pea-sized eggs. Sometimes they're oval-shaped. Um, and those ones are the, the eggs of the, the skinks. So they'll be buried in underneath. This is one of the spots where you might find um, a number of invertebrates that are sharing your life. Round the edges of the door, you'll notice that there's little bits of a spider web. And there are active spiders living in the corners of the door and windows and things like that. Why are they living there? Well, the, the thing is, we humans attract a lot of the, the sorts of things that they like to eat. Insects, of course. And we do this in two ways. One of which we have uh, food in our houses that the insects are feeding on. And so the excess of insects tends to feed the, the number of spiders. And secondly, we also have lighting. And the lights that are on inside our houses at night time attracts a number of insects. And that's what these spiders are doing here. They're building their webs in the corners of the windows and doors. And so all the insects that get attracted by the lights, as they're trying to find their way into the lights that are inside, they tend to get caught in the spider webs. The, the spiders themselves are a, a number of different species. The ones that build the funnel-shaped webs that you can see in the, uh, the corners of the windows, they're called black house spiders and um, they're not funnel webs despite the funnel shaped shape of the web uh, and they're a spider that probably most of you are going to have because there's a, one species or other seems to occur almost all the way around Australia and they also sometimes even live in the radiator grills of uh, people's cars so they go for, on holidays with us as well you also get things like the famous redback spider which will uh, be generally in places such as round the sides of plant pots and outdoor furnishings and things like that. And inside the house, of course, you'll get the uh, daddy long legs, which is a spider that's traveled with us right the way around the, the globe, hitching rides in furniture and containers and getting to countries that they would never have been able to reach without our help. Well, these are St. Andrew's cross spiders. They're more commonly found in the garden but um, in this particular case they have also made use of the, uh, the fact that the indoor lighting at night time attracts lots of insects and as a result they've been able to last longer into the winter time and also they're still laying eggs as you can see up here. Now the eggs are um, encased in uh, silk webbing that pr both protects them and uh, helps buffer them against the, the changes in weather. So if it's a very hot day, it'll sort of keep them uh, not from getting uh, uh, too hot. And if it's a very cold day, they'll keep them uh, from getting too cold. And this is how the, the eggs will um, survive the, um, uh, the, the weather conditions until they're ready to hatch. And as you can see by some of these egg cases, they have indeed already hatched. And the tiny baby spiders they will be the ones that survive the, the cooler um, weather during winter time and uh, spring, early spring time. And as the weather warms up and the, uh, lots of the insects start to um, 
uh, hatch out and move around and they'll get caught by the baby spiders, suddenly they'll put on a, a growth spurt and that's when you start seeing spiders all around the garden. Well, out in the garden, there, as I say, you can find life anywhere at all. But there are certain points where life will be a little bit more concentrated and where you're a bit more likely to notice it. One of these is underneath anything that you've got lying on the ground, like bricks, roofing tiles, uh, or any other uh, such thing. So here we have a pile of bricks. Let's have a look at and see what's underneath. These are slaters and uh, they're relatives of the, the prawns and the lobsters and things like that. And these are resting here underneath the, the bricks during the daytime because they're most active at night when uh, things like uh, predatory birds and um, uh, hot dry sunlight um, is not going to be affecting them. Now the slaters are, um, are in your garden basically as decomposing organisms. They feed on um, pretty much all organic matter, be it things like um, uh, bird droppings and um, uh, dead insects, right the way down to leaf litter and um, uh, bits and pieces of wood, such as this dead wood here. So that the slaters will be um, eating the, the decomposing uh, wood and leaf litter nearby and converting it back into um, humus in the soil which will then uh, be uh, available to the plants to recycle once again. The millipedes will also be doing the same thing. Centipedes on the other hand, uh, they're predators so they'll be feeding on the things that are breaking down the leaf litter and the dead wood. Well one of the other things you can do to increase the biodiversity in your uh, garden is to put in water of some uh, sort. So we, here we have a, a bird bath and that will cater for both uh, birds and flying insects. You can do even better if you put in a pond and then it's going to cater for both frogs, uh, dragonflies, damselflies and other water insects as well as the birds and any of the mammals that come through at night time as well. You can also put in feeding tables this is a bit controversial. There are some people who say that it's a, a good thing and some people who say that it's a bad thing. If you uh, are to limit the amount of food that you put out at any one time then you'll not get a glut of uh, certain aggressive birds that will keep the others away. This is particularly the case with the uh, predatory birds such as magpies, kookaburras, uh, currawongs and things like that which can build up in numbers and then that will uh, reduce the numbers of your smaller birds because, let's face it, they're the predators of the smaller birds. But small amounts don't seem to do too much harm. These little insects here, they might look like flies, but they're actually little native bees. These are the social bees. Most of the bees that we have in Australia are actually solitary bees and each one will build her own nest and look after it. But these ones live in a, a colony like honeybees do. And they make a honey which is known as sugar bag. And it's in this particular species it always has a, a lemony tang no matter what the bees themselves have been feeding on. But um, they tend to fly when the air temperature is about 18 degrees. So you know if you can see these guys coming and going that it's um, 18 degrees or above. And underneath here you can see the tunnels of an ant's nest. Now ants perform uh, multiple roles in the garden partly because there's so many different species of ants. Some of them are mainly predatory and will um, feed on um, insects and other small animals. Others are more omnivorous and they'll tend to, to feed on both plant and animal uh, bits and pieces. And um, uh, you'll get others again a bit more specialised and less likely to be found in the garden that have uh, mainly seed based diets and things like that. But in the garden, um, most of your ants are going to be generalists and they'll take both plant and animal food, which is why they'll attack the sugar bowl as readily as they'll uh, attack um, uh, the meaty parts of your lunch. 
but um, they're not necessarily uh, a bad thing to have in the garden. One of the things that uh, ants will do is um, they will help control uh, the numbers of flying termites that come in and um, a, a good uh, moat of ants around in your garden will help uh, stop um, forming uh, termites from forming uh, colonies too close to the house. Uh, if you're interested in, in trying to, uh, to find out what uh, insects and uh, are around in your garden, a good place to start is to look for a plant that has uh, been chewed. You can look at the leaves and see if there's, um, there's pieces out of the leaves. And this is certainly the case here with this plant. It's, uh, it's been very heavily uh, nibbled by, uh, by some sort of insect. It, it doesn't look typical of a caterpillar because it is, it's so extensive. There would not be, I don't think there would be enough caterpillars on this plant to chew that much. And the fact that they haven't eaten the whole leaf is more typical of a beetle than a, uh, than a, a caterpillar for a butterfly. They tend to start at one side of the leaf and chew their way right through the leaf and basically eat the whole leaf apart from perhaps the mid vein of the leaf. Uh, whereas beetles uh, tend to just nibble around the edges of a leaf like this. So I suspect that there is a beetle that's attacked this and a large number of them at, uh, at some stage. And what happens is when there's a, a, a proliferation of any species in nature, uh, there's a proliferation of their predators. Um, that's just the way the system works. And um, so if there's a lot of uh, beetles on this plant now, there'd probably be a lot of birds around trying to get those beetles uh, it's, uh, as a, the birds being the predator of that, of that beetle. That's the way, the way money works. Back again. <laughs> Back again. Hello there. <laughs> I'm just going to pull up that PowerPoint for you again. So, so that presentation uh, by by various people. Um, yeah, hopefully you found the, some of those details interesting. I'm sorry, there are some points there where we've been going to insert pictures so you could actually see what was being talked about, but we didn't quite get to that. So I do apologise for that. It can be a little bit... So it's much better when you can see the um, animals. The ants one is quite amazing. But uh, I hope you enjoyed that and also got some ideas, some hints about habitat as well and increasing biodiversity in the yard too. So I thought now we've talked about all of those insects um, in particular and I thought one of the ways for you when you're going out to try and identify things and learn about what you're seeing uh, there are various internet resources out there and the Wild Pollinate Account website uh, is one that I promote a lot and I think I promote it because it's a citizen science project and it's providing an opportunity uh, also for you guys to learn about your pollinators at the same time as you're able to, to contribute to scientific research on uh, wild pollinators. And, it, and it's really the key reason why I... Um, uh, I, I learn more about pollinators by undertaking a count, which is a 10 minute count at certain times of the year, uh, where you're just actually watching a plant to see what comes to visit. I, I was actually, I was completely stunned by the diversity of species that were actually at a plant. And, and I've been out with scientists, young scientists who are you know, at uni doing their, their study into pollinators and had not actually done the same thing either of observing a plant and seeing the number of species. So it really, it, it has great rewards if you do that. And the next one's coming up in November. So um, tune into the Wild Pollinator Account, maybe go on their uh, email list. But one of the resources that's really good uh, when you're trying to work out what um, species you're looking at are some of the uh, resources they have on the page. And this is an example of one of those resources which helps you to break up the insects you're seeing into different kind of groups. When you break up the insects into those groups, when you work out that it's not a wasp, it's a ant or whatever, or it's, it's not a wasp, it's a fly, it just means narrows down uh, the, the scientific group name that you're looking at 
and also um, then where to search to determine uh, what you're looking at. Um, they've got this particular guide that you can download and they've also got this, these tips as well uh, to help you separate the two. And I know this is just a screenshot, so you'll probably not be able to see that very clearly, but uh, it, it's all available on their page for you to have a look at. Um, and this one here I'm showing you because it mentions iNaturalist. And this is another site. So they partner up with an iNaturalist. They have a site within iNaturalist for the pollinators count. And you can go and join that. Um, you've got to create an iNaturalist account first, and then you can uh, join the Wild Pollinator Count Project. And of course, that will provide you with an awful lot of images, which helps you to research what you're looking at. Uh, and I'm hoping that that's not Simon telling me nobody can hear me. Um, uh, and then this is an example of their page. So, um, oh, actually, no, it's not. I'm lying about that. Um, so, yeah, so so when you go to the iNaturalist page and you have a look at the Wild Pioneer account, um, it's got a fantastic number of images. Oh, look at Can't that. See Can't see the screen. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Ah. Yeah. Ah, that was a bit... Are you just, are you guys all looking at me instead? You bet I can't see the screen. Oh, thank you so much for telling me that. Um, oh, I just rabbited on for ages about that. Here you go. I'm just going to quickly flick back so you can see them. So that's the wild pollinator count. Oh, actually, no, it's not. Uh, hmm. Sorry, it seems to be, okay. So Wild Pollinator Account page, uh, this is their research. This is the, the guide that uh, shows you tips on identifying insects. Uh, and this is the iNaturalist uh, page or the, the account that they have on iNaturalist. So, so I really highly recommend that page. And, and you guys are probably sick to death of me recommending it because I always do. Um, the other thing, if you're trying to, so little green beetle, so we're out there looking at that lily pilly. Brian was looking at that lily pilly and trying to work out what it was. I ended up with a picture, we weren't sure whether it was native or non native. So we, um, I put in small green beetle. I put in Australia so that it narrows the search so I don't get international insects. And um, so then you end up with, with something like a whole bunch of images and you'd scroll through those images to try and find the insect that looks like. This one's come up with the lily pilly beetle immediately, which was what that insect was that was on those lily pillies. And it's an insect that was more uh, abundant up in um, Queensland and has started to move further south. And it may have actually come through the nursery, you know, being helped by the nursery industry as well, but we're seeing it further north in Australia these days. So the, the little beetle is a lily peel beetle, it was the one that we saw. Now the other site, uh, and I cheated a little bit with this one because I put it in Brisbane, but the Brisbane insect site that you can now see on your screen, that this, this site is absolutely amazing. Um, it, um, he, he's got the most incredible images of insects uh, in great detail, lots of information. So if you're trying to identify an insect, this is a great site if it comes up. Uh, the other thing I forgot to mention, and you probably all know this, is that when you do the Google search, you put in the title and then you click images so that you're searching for images uh, and it's the best way. Um, but the Brisbane Insect Site, this is an example, um, and it's an example of what Brian was talking about actually, regarding the damage that beetles do, or damage, what beetles do when they're eating the leaves, what that looks like. So he mentioned the way that beetles will eat around the, the leaf, the edge of the leaf, and this is a good example of that. So there's really great information on this site. So I really recommend going to, um, yeah, to, uh, when you're searching to try and identify your insects, this is the kind of thing you do. But um, even with plants, it, it is trying to get a descriptor of some sort that will narrow down what you're looking for. And it can be quite amazing uh, what you find. So I'm now going to a blank screen just to um, identify that. That, that really um, is it for talking about the invertebrates. 
So I'm just going to leave this uh, page delicately uh, by stopping to share. There you go there, hello. Um, and I've got to look and see what our next um, timetable is. Okay, so now we're going to go into uh, pollinators, frogs. Uh, so the next session is going to be about frogs and Simon's going to uh, pull up um, a, a um, session, a, a presentation from the um, frog ID. No. Is it Simon? Something like that. Something like he's so nice. Let's, let's just go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll let you go to it. But um, yeah, so, so this one uh, to help you with identifying frogs. Okay, Simon. Australia's frogs are under threat from habitat loss, disease and climate change and we need your help to keep them safe. Friday is Australia's first national account with a scientific rescue mission and everybody can take part. It's easy, download the Australian Museum Frog ID app, head to your park, pond, creek or dam, listen out for frogs and record their calls. Who knows, you may even discover a new frog city. With your help we can save the frogs of Australia. So let's get counting. Right, that was very short. <laughs> you're muted, Liz. Is that the only one you're going to show from that? That was, that that was the short one. One of the short ones. Yeah, that's the short one. So, you can so tell just, just to let you know that there's other sites there as well. Um, and those sites are... Um, uh, there's there, Within that site, there's another video that they show, and it tells you how to um, download uh, the Frog ID um, app and how to use that app. So what permissions and all of those sort of things, because it's going to ask you to allow um, location permissions uh, and it's going to ask you things like that. that. That Frog ID site now has got to such an incredible degree that you can actually download all the data and, and keep it on your phone. Um, so that when you go into a remote area, you don't actually need internet access and you can look up and see what frog species uh, are in the area that you're actually in. So you're not just looking broadly. Uh, it will narrow it down for you. You can put in various parameters to reduce the different types of species you're looking at. Uh, it provides you with calls. And they've also done this amazing thing, which they describe uh, when they're describing how to use the app, uh, where they'll have the... The, the species that are most abundant are larger images in your area, and then there'll be small images for the less abundant ones uh, so that you can, and also they've also mixed in the time of year. So they've added a time factor and identified what you're likely to be hearing at a certain time of year, which is quite amazing. It's, a, it's an incredible um, app. So I very much highly recommend that you use that app. Um, as far as Willoughby is concerned, we've got about eight different species of frogs. Um, I do have, I'm terrified of trying to go to the slide presentation to show you the, the web page. So, uh, cause I, I think it'll probably, Lord knows where I'll end up. Um, so instead of that, I'll just uh, let you know that if you go to the Willoughby Council web page and, and choose the uh, environment section or search for uh, wildlife, uh, do a Willoughby Council wildlife search, you'll come to the web page um, and find a listing. So a listing of animals. And in that you will find the actual species list of frogs. So when you're trying to work out what you've got in your area, it's great to use a site like th that list because it narrows down what's, what you're likely to be looking at and makes it much, much easier for you to determine it. Um, so you can use that list uh, to help you when you're using the Frog ID site and to search in the Frog ID site as well. It's quite good. Um, and as well on that site, uh, there's also the reminder that you can share your images. Uh, we've got a few frog uh, pictures in our Willoughby um, wildlife, oops, uh, <laughs> in the gallery page, the, the fauna photo gallery page. But we'd love more pictures of the species of frogs so that when people are trying to work out what frog they're looking at, um, they can actually uh, have a look at the frogs that that have been seen in Willoughby and are on that gallery page. 
We don't really want pictures of frogs from Central Australia or anything like that. Uh, we prefer local uh, species if that's possible. Um, but yeah, so you're more than welcome to share images and that's identified also on that site, how to share images if you'd like to. The other thing that can be invaluable, and I'm, I'm reaching over and, and grabbing some of these books. Um, so frog ID books, if you're, you're feeling very serious, you can borrow books like this from the library. It's really weird because I'm looking at it as a mirror thing, it's back to front. Um, uh, but you can borrow books like that uh, from the library, for, uh, identification books from the library, which are really uh, helpful uh, too, and particularly if you're going out into a broader area. But they give you inf interesting information about the species as well, which is pretty cool. Um, and, and I should stop rabbiting on now um, about frogs because we need to move on to mammals. Um, and Simon has put together a small presentation uh, about mammals, but and, and I think, Simon, if you show that presentation and then after you've shown uh, the images of some of the amazing mammals that uh, we see around, then uh, Naren Williams is going to talk a little bit about um, identifying scats uh, in the environment. The other thing I didn't mention to you and should have is when you're thinking about frogs and why we're moving on to mammals is often frogs are nocturnal, so they're going to be more active at night time that's when you're going to see them and you'll be able to probably be able to hear them. Some of them call during the day, but mostly it's nighttime. So it's very much a nighttime activity rather than daytime. Mammals are a little bit similar to that. You'll see the signs of mammals and Simon Marilyn will talk to you about that. But it's, uh, we're lucky enough to have some monitoring cameras. So we capture pictures of what animals are out and about at nighttime. So Simon will show you some of those now. Over to you, Simon. Okay, thank you very much. Look, um, I, I, I'm new at this too. So look, I've just got a short little video of um, uh, just some of the um, things we've captured on our, our wildlife cameras, but I'm not sure I can actually talk over it. So you're just going to have to listen to a minute, look at a minute of, of just footage. Um, the, the cameras we've had for about eight years now, um, and there have been a tremendous, uh, um, sorry, I'm just trying to pick it up now. Um, uh, they've been a tremendous resource, uh, giving us all sorts of information on a whole range of different wildlife that we, we have in the area that we normally wouldn't have any record of. But anyway, here we go. Okay, that was short. Um, look, the, the, the great thing about um, the, the camera traps is some of those rarer species like the sugar glider, uh, we wouldn't have had a lot of record of, except for the cameras and, and certainly being able to see uh, what flowers they're visiting. Um, but uh, the most eye-opening was the, um, the, the foxes and the presence of foxes uh, and just also identifying potential breeding areas. We've now identified at least seven areas where there are kits or young that are turning up. Um, and we wouldn't have had that information if we hadn't those cameras. Um, but of course, those, those cameras are available through council. And if you want to borrow them for use at your home, you're more than welcome. Even Liz's ones. <laughs> but anyway, so all right, uh, Narwin can take over from here with scats and stuff. Liz? Uh, sorry, Simon, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, good, isn't it? And I can uh, see Narrow in there, ready to go, is he? Oh, good, yes. <laughs> Simon? Yep. Simon's talking to you. Can you hear him? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yep. Oh, and I'm sure everyone else can. 
Narwin is speaking. Can you hear Narwin? No. No, he can't. Oh, I did, on and off. Can you see Narwin's screen? I, I can see the screen, but not, not, um, not enlarged. Can anyone else? Have others, can other people, participants see Narwin's screen? They're all in the same spot. They've all gathered together at someone's backyard. <laughs> Maybe they should. What do you mean they're all in the same spot? <laughs> I'm, I'm off quarantining. You're, you're all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Uh, D can see, but not hear. You can sign that earphone. Indeed, everyone can see but not hear. Thanks, Steve. I, I have your earphones. Um, it's, it, it, it's great learning these new uh, technologies, no, isn't it? <laughs> what if I just bring the laptop down to where an arrow is? Excellent. I think that's it. Yeah, a... that'll happen. Well, what's the term? Pivoting. We're pivoting. Pivoting. We're pivoting. <laughs> Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's going to be interesting. Oh, there you go. That's perfect. <laughs> perfect. Okay. All right, down. I have to go a bit closer. Okay. okay. They're looking at the blue box, blue at, the box at the moment. There you go, a little bit better. Wow, this is that interesting. Is. Now, can you see some scats on there? So, something over your lens. Over the lens. Narrow one's chin, probably. <laughs> Is that okay? Yep. Okay, Liz is going to point to the scats for me now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So over on the, you can see a long, quite large scat, which has got a white section, which usually attached. Now that's usually a, a, like signifies a reptile, and that's a, a python species. So it'd be like a diamond python. And then next to that one, is a long cylindrical scat, which uh, is from an echidna. So that's quite a distinctive scat. And when you, of course, break it open, you can see insect particles in the scat. And if you come down, these are the sort of larger scats. So this one here, if you're lucky enough to have wallabies coming up into your backyard, you can see um, the comparison of the size to Liz's hand. They're quite reasonably large size. And you'll see the vegetation material inside the scat. So they're mostly feeding on grass and shrub, shrubs, some leaves. So they can, yeah, so that's when you break it open. So looking inside a scat can really help you identify um, some of the potential you know, species. Okay. Now we've got an, a little assortment here. Of, we've got ringtail possum scats, which are, are smaller than the brush tail scats and koala scats. And again, Oh yeah, so the one that is a koala scat. That, that those are koala scats. So you can see how similar they look to the brush tail possum scats. That one? Which are at the top there. But there's a few there's a few different sort of characteristics that you that you can use to identify. So the koala one has very fine ridges, which you probably I'm not sure whether you'll be able to see because of the I'm trying. The light. I'm trying. But and a little yeah. and often a little point no, at one end. Yeah, too it's too hard. hard. But anyway, it gives you an idea point. of the, the sort of similarities. Um, We're not going to have hairs in their backyards. Well, hopefully you won't have hairs in your backyards, but if you do, that's sort of what they look like. They're similar to the rabbit scats. And then moving on to some smaller species. Actually, just bring it up. There, so bring it to a bit more. Okay, so these little, little tiny scats. Uh, from an antichinus. Oh, sorry. Now they would definitely be have been around and and hopefully still are in some parts of Willoughby, but they but again the again the uh, if you look inside the antichinus scats, they eat a lot of insects. So you'd break it open, you'd see insect particles, as opposed to a small rodent species like a mouse or a, or one of the bush rats, which would have be vegetation material in it, and you wouldn't see the insect certainly like insect material. You'd see seed particles. And then oh. move over yep. there. Yep. Is that all right? Yep. Um, they're actually from 
a glider species. So oh. there was squirrel glider. And again, when you break those open, if you hold that, I don't know if you can turn that little broken bit. Yeah. That little over further. The little broke the broken section. That one? No, that, that one. one. That one. Hey. Yeah, so sort of, again, looking in, inside the, um, uh, you know, you can see, because they sap and nectar, so it's often quite sticky, actually, when you break them open. You can sort of feel the, mm. a, almost a stickiness when you break it. So, and then, uh, oh, and yes, yeah, so when Liz was mentioning about the, the reptile eggs, um, be, before there, you can see the sort of slightly elongated, They've got a bit of a rubber, rubbery sort of outside uh, shell to it. Those ones, have, obviously, they've hatched. Um, and so that's what you might find. You know, if, you, if you're going, uh, say, digging in your compost pile, mulch pile, they're often like... Weeding in the garden. Weeding in the garden, yeah. They can even be, you know, just in, in, the, in the lawn even as well. Um, it, they do pick areas that provide a good temperature for the, that the eggs need for the growth of the young so that's why compost piles are really great for for the the small skinks and the snakes to lay their eggs in um and they're quite communal with the, the small skinks you see the garden skinks so they'll you could find 20 say 20 eggs and it'll be from numerous uh the small skinks oh. so that's yeah another there. Uh, the ones and see there again these are reptile so this this one's from a small snake. So I think it was from a golden crown snake, actually, that one. Mm. So they're, they're sort of long, twisted, joined together. Um, again, when you break them up, you'll find uh, that tiny one, yeah, is, is a skink. Mm. And that's got a little bit of white on the end. And then again, the in, you'll see the insect material. Now, some of the, some of the reptiles will have uh, eat vegetation as well. So you could find vegetation in it too. And frogs, that small one there, frogs are more similar to, to that, say a Peron's tree frog is maybe a little bit broader, but the, the insect material, the way it is, I say it, it's like a looser, it's like a looser scat. So in terms of um, the particles are often bigger because they just swallow them more rather than crunching. So you might get uh, wing part, parts of wings that are larger. Yeah rather than uh, sort of broken up more. Yeah, right. So that's sort of one way you can, and they also have the white as well at the end, which is the uric, uric acid part. And this is a good book, one of the few books actually, on track scats and other traces. So that's a really good one to help you identify some of the scats in your, in your backyard. And just the other thing you might find oh. as well is the snake skins. Oh, narrowing, can I interrupt you? What's that? Yes. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, Dee has just asked the question. Um, well, first of all, I think you said uh, reptile scats have the white bits at the end. Yeah. Uh, the urea. But also, how do you differentiate between the, all those scats and rat droppings? Uh, on the one species or within no, the... So, no, well, I think probably black rats. Would that be right, Dee? The black rats? Are the, how, how do you tell the difference between... Uh, Possum and a black rat, or, or the different types of black rats. If you yeah, can. so then, so it's working off off the shape. Um, so shape and, and material. So again, with the possum, with the possum scat. So it's you've often got like a flat side to it, uh, and a bend like a little bit like a banana, and that can also be like a, a black rat can have that, but it's usually often more pointed at the ends. Whereas you can see these. Got almost a flat end what about around it. Size end. wise, size wise, they can be the possum really? ones are normally the are normally fatter than the rats. Yeah. So the, the the other black rats will be a bit more slender than this, generally. Generally, but there's so much variation as you can mm. see from looking at that that uh, variation in the scats. They can be smaller, longer, mm. you know, different, slightly different shapes. But generally, there's a, a certain mm. characteristic. So even with a bush between a bush rat. Actually, bush rats are actually slightly rounder than the black rat scats. So, yeah, so it's, it's, there's little subtle differences. So, it so, does take a little so bit that to, one there. So, this one. Right there. So, there it is. So, this is the antichinus. Oh, I don't know how to hold that. There you go. That, that. So, how do you know that that would be not a rat and would be an antichinus? Yeah, so, break, so, breaking that open, you'll right. see insect 
particles, which are shiny. You'll see that there's shiny parts in there. Which oh, may, this is very hard to do. Be, that was why we need a microscope. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they Can't usually glint, that. you know, it'll glint in the, in the light. So oh, yeah. they're often fairly, fairly easy to tell that there's insect particles. Um, then with the rodents, oh. you know, they're eating vegetation and seeds yeah. generally. So, um, and black rats, well, of course, they, they do eat a lot. Um, so, yeah. Oh, I've just got a message. Do you have a fox cat? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a fox cat. However, this, I guess, the just looking at the the uh, python, the python's cat, just yeah. in terms of shape, I guess. So that would be what I would describe more closely to a dog. Now, a fox cat would be much more pointed Pointy? pointed at one end with a bit more of a even more of a twist sometimes as well but of course fox cats eat foxes eat a variety of oh. things as well so okay. i've actually seen a fox cat which is solely mistletoe mistletoe berries that's all it was the whole the whole scat they will also just eat insects so then you might get um, you know it was just solely you know uh, uh you know grasshoppers or crickets you know yeah, so they tend to find a food source. Sometimes it's quite abundant. And they'll eat that. And that'll that'll all basically become into the scat. Um, now the other thing is, of course, the if they eat, say, small mammals, you'll see the fur. You'll see the fur and the um and and some bones in there as well. So so that's one thing to say. Compare it to a wallaby, say, because sometimes wallaby scats will be elongated and sort of joined together, and they can look long and pointed. So that's one thing again, break it open and, and then you can see whether it's vegetation or whether you can see it's whether it's insects <laughs> or bones or fur. So, so you did find one, did have fur? Yeah, so there's a good chance yeah, that it was a fox. Um, can, can I just throw in one other thing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, on, on hygiene of handling scats. <laughs> oh, yes, good one. Yeah, yeah. Did you want to, do you want me to talk about it? Oh, just, oh, look, just, just recently I went to a fox control um, a workshop and they were talking about certain pathogens being within the fox scats and that, uh, strictly speaking, if you're handling lots of them, you probably would, would be better to wear a respirator. Um, but uh, certainly gloves uh, are needed. Yeah, certainly gloves. For, especially for, for your predators that um, are likely to have more uh, pathogens that might harm us, sort of. You can handle as many wallaby scats as you like, but uh, you wouldn't handle a fox scat. I yeah. think that's my understanding. No, no, that's true. And what we've done, like when on the surveys when we're doing it, we've often made a uh, chopstick out of sticks. So we can actually pick, you know, if we need to pick the scat up because we were collecting them. So we'd just do that to avoid handling them directly. Um, and then, and if we do handle them, obviously washing our hands, you know, thoroughly afterwards. Um, but certainly gloves, great thing. Um, and you can use, you can always use a stick to break it open as well. So if you got, if it's on the ground, you just push the stick down onto it. So you're not actually touching the scat. That's what we generally do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Hannah, I reckon we should move on to the next, next topic now. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. So, so just before moving on, sorry about that. Sorry about getting so close to the screen. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, we were going to, we've got a, so Narwin's going to be, uh, has done a small presentation that's just about mainly focusing on garden skinks because they're often, uh, they're a very common species, but often uh, not really that well understood about the differences between them. So he's done this lovely presentation about that, which we will watch now. Um, but um, as well as that, if you, again, if you go to the webpage, I think we've got 20 species of reptiles, if not more, 20 A's uh, in Willoughby. And so now I'm just gonna be talking about this, the, the garden skinks, but there's a whole stack of other reptiles as well. Lots of uh, different species of snakes and things like that. Uh, so have a look at the webpage if you're wanting to know just how many species and what those species are. Because again, when you're in the garden, uh, unfortunately for our snakes, um, a lot of people see a golden crown snake and they're under the impression that maybe that's a brown snake um, or green tree snakes, uh, again, get mistaken for brown snakes. Uh, so there's a whole series. And, and um, so it's good to be able to look at your snakes and to know that there's quite a variety of species and have a little bit of an idea about what they should look like. 
Um, we've got a few images on our webpage, but if anybody happens to come across uh, reptile, uh, lizards, uh, snakes, and good pictures, it'd be lovely for you to share them, it would be really fantastic. Um, so I'll hand you over to Simon now, and he will have a, he will show um, now on to presentation. Hello everyone, and welcome to our backyard. I hope you got your uh, This segment about small critters. Okay, so if you're interested in finding out what reptile species might be in your yard, the best way is to pick a good spot in different parts of your yard, near some different habitats within it, have a seat, sit quietly and just observe. You'll be able to see movement of the skinks, and then you'll get to know where they are and then you might be able to position yourself on another day uh, and, and be able to get a closer look. Like I said, if you can use some use some binoculars to help you view it. Um, you, if you've got a good camera you could potentially take some photos of them as well um, and that way you can zoom in and get a close look at the detail. But condition wise, uh, weather conditions, it's really good if it's a like a calm still day with you know a good sunny morning, best time is in the morning to observe. Um, of course if it's really cold um, then you might want to wait until a bit later morning to have a look. But you can always have a look at different times of the day just to see what's active. So with uh, reptiles being um, like cold-blooded they do need to they do rely on the sun to help warm them up and then go and forage. Some some species will be more sit and wait where they'll just watch watch for things to come past and they go out and grab it. Other species will actually active, actively search. That's like the, the small skinks they will often uh, search through, through the leaf litter and vegetation and looking for insects to, to grab. They will sometimes tackle things that are much, you know, that you think are too large for them to uh, to grab. I've seen one chasing a uh, like butterfly um, as well, sort of leaping up after it. Uh, I didn't see it grab it, but it was certainly trying. <laughs> You'd be surprised uh, at the number of skinks that you can get in your garden. Um, you might just sort of see lots of little ones running around and think they're all the one species. There are three there are three common skinks that you can get in your garden. Um, two of them are, hang around in the leaf litter on the ground most of the time. They will come up into the shrubs and vegetation, and that's the ones we're looking at at the moment. And then there is another one that tends to really prefers being on the wall of your house or on tree trunks, and that's where they forage. They're very fast, those ones. Okay, this is one of the little garden skinks that is quite common in uh, Sydney's backyards and up and down the coast. It's called Lamprophyllus delicata. And you can see on the back, it's fairly uniform dark brown on the back, but on the tail, it actually has some white flecking. On the side, it has a dark, dark area running down the side and then sort of fading into a lighter grey. Has a fairly pointed nose but just, and also just on the edge, just on the lateral edge there, there's a, a slight gold line. And you can see those small feet, they've got quite long sharp claws on them. That's a pointed snout, small eyes. This is um, almost full size. They can get a, a bit larger than this. Now you notice I'm, I am holding the skink very carefully. I'm not holding it by its tail because as many of you would know skinks lose their tails if you grab it. Uh, it is a defense mechanism so that if they're being grabbed by a predator or chased by a predator and they will wiggle their tail and hope the predator grabs the tail instead. The tail does actually have a, a role to play though as well being an extra I guess food reservoir for them like a store, like a fat store as well. So if they lose their tail they'll, they'll be a little bit depleted in their food reserves however they fortunately can grow their tail back and interestingly the pattern of their tail often changes once they've lost it after the first time. Now the other skink that is similar to this one 
you'll often notice a dark vertebral stripe down its back. It will also be uh, usually a greyer colour on the back than this one, and a little bit more robust in its build. But otherwise, you know, the adults are pretty much similar size. These guys probably a little bit smaller, but otherwise very similar. The other species also has a dark area down the side of its body as well. But also, actually another, and another thing is you can look for those white spots, the, the white flecks that are on the tail of this one. The Lamprophyllus glyconodi, which is the other one I'm talking about, has white flecks running along the body as well. So you have, you know, you do have to get a pretty close look at these guys to see the differences. However, if you, like I said, if you can use binoculars or just move very slowly, get close to the skinks, get them used to you being there, you can actually see see them up close. Or you can just see its tongue there, coming out, tasting the air. All good? Yep, thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that was amazing. Um, so hopefully uh, that will motivate you to being a little bit, uh, taking a little bit more notice of your skinks and, and uh, just what, what you're looking at when, when you've got garden skinks there, what you're actually looking at. Now, um, we, di we did, were gonna show you some pictures of other reptiles as well, but I think you've seen a lot of the images of Eastern water dragons. We, you know, we've got lace monitors here and things like that. So, um, they're probably less likely to be in your yard, but you might be lucky enough to have them in your yard. Um, because of the time, because it's now 11.20, I'm just going to move on to show you a short presentation uh, that's just highlights uh, how you can find out about birds and where's the best place to familiarise yourself with bird species. Um, so, and you'll have to wish me luck to, to, um, that this works. Oh, was I going to present that video on bird data or? I, I think that because of the timing, we maybe will just, uh, I'll show just the, the slide presentation because it mentions the site, if that's okay. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So I just, uh, are you able to see the screen? Is that showing? Yep. Excellent. Wonderful. Um, so just a short presentation. Uh, the images that you're seeing here are, are thanks to the local residents. Um, these these photos, and if you're trying to work out your bird species, actually the fauna, the birds photo gallery, in our fauna photo gallery on the web page, the council web page is actually really good, and has uh, thanks to the generosity of local residents, we've got some amazing images to help you identify your birds. At the moment, that screen that you're looking at, you can only see um, uh, the image of the bird, but when you hover over that image, uh, you get the the species of the bird as well. So it could be really helpful for you for working out what species uh, you might be looking at. Uh, and this is just some of the uh, species you may be familiar with, such as the powerful owl. Um, I, I won't, it's just to, to show you some of the images that have been shared. As you can see here, these interesting, the different uh, goshawks, uh, the lyrebird, which we all know about, and the, the little silver eye here. And just keeping in mind too, when you share photos, they don't have to be up close photos. And this little silver eye still is showing so much detail. And they don't always have to be in focus to demonstrate what, uh, to be able to identify the bird. So you don't have to feel like you have to take uh, a highly detailed image. This one, uh, we were able to tell that that was a rose robin. Big, oh, great spelling on my part. <laughs> we were able to tell that it was a rose robin uh, because of the, um, uh, because of that photo, even though it was very blurry. So they're still invaluable um, uh, to, to share. And, and this is just a, a slide uh, to show you the web page and under animals and the different sites. And if you click on that birds icon, what you get is a, a mass, the, the full list of species um, that are there. This is to demonstrate where you go to if you want to submit your wildlife sightings. Uh, and that will take you on our web page and that will take you to uh, send an email to Simon and he can get back to you about your sighting. And with the wildlife photos, you email Wildlife Watch 
uh, to ask if you've got some photos you'd like to share. So that's a separate thing. We're hoping to improve that so it's just one form that you fill in. Now, if you're trying to identify your birds, I'd, these guys are by far the best birds, bird life and, and what they do. If you want to learn about birds, this is really it as far as learning. So they've got various platforms. In this case, on this platform, there's a bird finder uh, in the Birds and Backyards program that helps you identify things. Uh, at the moment, if you go to the bird life site and you can find uh, this page, uh, you'll find a whole stack of information. It's birding at home is the page and you'll find there uh, this image, the central image. Uh, they've got a whole series of videos that they did, uh, presentations that they've done uh, for birding at home uh, that you can watch, which are really great. I think they use Facebook as a platform, but I think they're now on YouTube. But you can see there's also other interesting things there on that, that same page that you can investigate as well. So. So really going to BirdLife uh, and finding that page uh, is invaluable. And, and that's it for that one. Um, so I'm stopping sharing that. Um, yeah, so that that uh, is birds uh, for birds. And, and birds are incredibly complicated. They're the things that we hear, you can use sound. Some people uh, are able to identify their bird species just from the call and you'll probably be able to identify maybe 10, at least 10 species because you're familiar with their calls. So um, yeah, it's, it's uh, a great thing to be able to hear, but also then visually as well, if you see them too. Um, and I, I'm, I'm tickling a bit quickly because I know that we've really gone over time and it's time for you guys to go. Uh, and so I want to identify that we're actually today, I'm presenting from uh, a very kind resident who's allowed me to visit their garden. Um, and I'm presenting from their garden. And that person uh, is also the person who um, runs uh, Willoughby Wildlife Facebook page. And, and I'd just like to introduce her. I'd like to thank you, Meredith, for, for having us here. And uh, Meredith's just going to talk to you briefly about uh, Wildlife Willoughby Facebook. Yeah. Hello everyone, my name's Meredith Foley and I'm part of a very small team that runs uh, Wildlife Willoughby. It's a, a Facebook site for the community and we invite you to um, follow us on, on Facebook. Just put in Wildlife Willoughby and you'll find us. We share photographs and information um, and events that are coming up that might interest people about the animals and the, um, the, the plants that grow in the Willoughby region and across the Lower North Shore. So if you have an opportunity, if you're on Facebook, come and uh, join the community there. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Meredith. Sorry about that, you guys. Um, thank you. Um, it is, it's a beautiful site uh, and it's beautifully designed. It's one of those Facebook sites that's got really lovely images and things. So it's quite a pleasure to look through and, and uh, see. Um, so it's time for us to finish. And, and the other thing I wanted to finish on uh, when we started, I talked about the urban, I've got to look now because I'm, I'm tired and <laughs> I can't remember anything. Um, so the urban naturalist, uh, urban naturalist um, paid project, um, that, that project also would like to hear from people who are um, interested in sharing uh, their um, images and, and stories. So they would love to encourage people You've, you've gone out, you've observed, uh, you've over maybe a period of time learned a little bit about the local wildlife in your area. And uh, it's an opportunity for you then maybe to write a, a small story. So on the platform of their page, they actually provide you with an outline uh, so that you can uh, uh, write uh, two, maybe 200 words about some animal that you've seen. You might like to share a picture, it might be a photo or it might be a bit of artwork. Uh, to illustrate that as well, uh, but the information is all there on the uh, on the page. So we'll be able to share with all of you that have participated today, uh, or send through an email with a list of all of those different um, web pages uh, and where you can find the information. So you'll have the links there. Um, and so I'm going to hand over. I think now possibly some people may have uh, questions. Uh, but, but I'm not sure, and if not, and if you're just going to start to leave the page, I'd really like to thank you for attending. It's really lovely that you came along. And um, 
Uh, I hope to see you at some of the Wildlife Watch activities that we may do. We, we're still not resuming those Wildlife Watch activities in person as yet. We're still waiting uh, to see how things go. And, and also, I have to say, I really do hope that all of you are staying well uh, and safe during this time too. It's been quite an interesting time, hasn't it? Um, but yes, and thank you to Simon Brown uh, and to uh, Meredith Foley, to Naren Williams, uh, and uh, also to Martin Robinson and, see, Brian Wilson <laughs> as well uh, for all of your assistance and also all of your presentations, uh, some great presentations. In, we may, we've recorded this session. Uh, it probably needs a little bit of editing, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to share the session uh, as well with you guys. But um, yeah, thank you. And um, I'm going to hand over to Simon Brown now. Uh, so he can uh, identify if there's any questions or anything else. I'll hand over to me. What for? There are no questions, just compliments. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for your support. And yeah, we hope we can get back out there in the person soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you.